Welcome or welcome back everyone to the 2024 ArchivesSpace Virtual Member Forum. I'm Jessica Crouch, the Community Engagement Lead for ArchivesSpace. We have a very full schedule uh, and I'm going to very quickly take care of a few housekeeping items before we dive in. You can find the forum wiki, which has the agenda and other information in the chat in just a moment. We have several members of the forum planning team, team on hand that can help if you have any questions about the forum, but that link will be your best resource. You can leave and come back during sessions today as you wish. Your connection information will remain the same. We are recording today's sessions and recordings will be linked in the event wiki page in the coming days. Unlike yesterday, we are using Zoom meeting for today's events. So if you were here yesterday, it's a little bit different. You're welcome to use the chat today for general questions, um, as well as questions that you may have for the presenter. However, you are also welcome and encouraged to unmute yourself during Q&As if you'd like to ask a question of the presenters. Keep in mind there are many participants and attendees at this forum coming from a variety of institutions and experience levels. The Archive Space Code of Conduct applies to all Archive Space events, including virtual events. Please remember to be considerate and respectful in your interactions with your fellow attendees, presenters, forum planning team, and to the program team staff in the Q&A and chat. And now for some thank yous. First, thank you to our forum planning team. Archive Space is a community supported program and we require the input, effort, and expertise of our members in all things, including in planning wonderful events like this. I'm very grateful to this year's forum planning team to solicit for soliciting presentations and developing this agenda. It speaks to the depth of expertise in our community that we have such a variety of presentations to learn from, but it takes time, effort, and patience to pull something like this together. So a sincere thank you to Alex McGee, Bailey Grace Harrell, Christine Liebson, Jackie Johnson, Katerina Dichumadu Schuster, Regina Heberlein, and Sarit Ham. And thank you to all of the presenters and discussion leaders we will hear from over the next two days. Or Well, we already heard from them. I'm reading from a script, if you can't tell. That we heard from and we'll hear from today. Each presenter will be introduced in their session, but I wanted to acknowledge them here as well. We couldn't have forums like this without engaged users willing to share their knowledge and experiences with the rest of the community. I've said this at every forum, and I've said it for the past few sessions, but it is true. We have a lot on our plates right now, and I am very appreciative for each presenter dedicating the time and energy to participate in this forum. So a sincere thank you to everyone on this list. And last, thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to two great days of presentations, discussions, and learning. Please feel free to chime in during Q&As, connect with one another in the chat, or let's just enjoy this last day together. Again, I'm reading from a script. Uh, so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen, uh, and Julia, if you'd like to go ahead and start sharing yours while I read your introduction. Perfect. Okay. All right. So our first session for today is ArchivesSpace Governance and You. As a member-driven organization, ArchivesSpace relies on the insight and contributions of members from member institutions to drive the nation's leading archival information system forward. I like that. In this session, members of the Archive Space Governance Board, with support from the chairs of the Technical Advisory Council and User Advisory Council, will present an overview of the Governance Board and its member representatives. The board chair will talk about recent initiatives and discussions among the group. Then the speakers will hold a panel discussion about the benefits of participating in governance and other Archive Space community opportunities, like TAC and UAC. There will be additional time for a Q&A from attendees. Thanks. Over to you, Julia. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this second day of the member forum. Um, our presentation today, it's not just me, of course, it's all of my, my wonderful um, members of the Archive Space Governance Board, as well as our chairs of the TAC and UAC. So I'm very excited for you to get to hear from everybody else, too, and not just hear me blab for 50 minutes. Um, so our agenda, we're just Thank you all for joining us again. Um, we're going to go over a little bit of uh, the overview of governance, um, some of our roles, some of what we do here. We'll have an introduction to your member reps and um, the chairs of the UAC and TAC if you're not familiar with us yet. Um, a little bit about some recent initiatives and discussions, both from the governance board and also from the UAC and the TAC. Um, we have a panel discussion plan, just some general questions, um, get some get some thoughts going. I love I love hearing from my fellow uh, board members and everything. It's, it'll be wonderful. And then we have plenty of time for an open Q and A if people have um, additional things that that come up during this meeting or that you've had burning questions all along. Um, please feel free. We can we'll open up the floor then too. So. 
the governance board of archive space. Um, so our purpose is to provide leadership for the archive space community and also to help advise Lear Assess, our organizational home, about ongoing development and support. Um, we have representatives from all different levels of membership. Um, we encourage everybody to participate. Everybody gets a voice. We want everybody to be able to provide guidance on the development of the application. Um, we help to set membership policies review and approve budgets and resource allocation. That is a very handy skill that you get when you get on the governance board. If you haven't dealt with budgets before, this is definitely um, something that's really important um, within the board too. Um, help advise on program initiatives. And, and that's one of, I think, one of the things that I've really enjoyed the most working on with the governance board. We also wanna focus on meeting the needs of a broad, a diverse, um, you know, a variety of our archival institutions not only in North America, but around the world. We want to make sure that we're dealing with these in a balanced and equitable manner. Um, this also includes our diversity partnership, which I'll touch on um, in a further in a little bit. So with the board, we um, we do meet quarterly. Um, we run from July to June, and actually our third quarter meeting, which usually takes place around February, we actually do that one as like a, a more extended session. Um, in the past, when when traveling was a little bit easier for folks, um, there were the third quarter third quarter board meeting tended to be in person. Um, for the last several years, we've we've done all of our meetings virtually, um, but had kind of like a two day component to it. So usually the first day of that um, quarter three meeting is our general board meeting, and then the second day we might do an activity or we might um, have a discussion planned or that sort of thing. So it's kind of like a special like learning activity involved with that. Um, so throughout these meetings, we cover all sorts of topics, of course. So there's operations reports, our financial reports, and our budgets. Um, we have updates coming in from committees, from different representatives, um, and also handle action items as well. And that's that gets to be a lot of fun work. Um, so really growing and sustaining membership, and, and again, growing the membership too, this is really a key priority for us. Um, this also includes our educational program membership. So that allows Archive Space to be a teaching tool and it's intended to support learning and instruction um, for folks who are using the Archive Space application for students and you know archival education and library schools, that sort of thing. So since 2022, the archival, the Archive Space Education Program um, membership now also includes the option to request um, a personal, like sorry, a university or an organization um, sandbox for that institution to use by their students, which is something that we found um, has had some really good feedback too. And hopefully if folks are being trained in archive space in, in an educational setting, they will go on and they will want to implement this and use this at other institutions, which will again help with our membership and growth, which is excellent. So our the governance board composition, uh, we have five elected members there's um, also one member from each project partner institution. Um, there's generally at least one um, ex officio non-voting member from Lyricist senior management as well. Um, there are a couple of other of us who are ex officio non-voting members right now too, but we'll get into that. So um, for, for this part, I would love it if my fellow uh, board members who are here would mind um, you know, talking about whenever your name comes up. So um, first from our very large membership level, um, we have Natalie Adams, who was unable to attend today. Um, she is the Engagement and Development Manager for Estates at Cambridge University. And um, it's been very exciting to have Natalie on the board because we're getting that international perspective, um, which is great. It's re been really useful from our perspective to have somebody on hand who is not just here in North America. So Natalie's been on the board since 2021. Thanks, Julia. Um, uh, hi, I'm Kate Crow. I am a representative for large institutions. Um, I'm a curator of special collections and archives at the University of Denver, and I um, was so excited to uh, have the opportunity to serve on the board. I'm really passionate about shared governance for systems like archive space. Um, I've been at DU for 15 years. Um, and for most of those 15 years, we've been using archive space. Um, and I, one of my very long ago supervisors used to say somewhat hyperbolically that it was the source of all wisdom and knowledge. Like it's the place where all the metadata lives and you push it out elsewhere. And so um, I'm, I'm so excited to be on the board and um, support 
the ongoing sustainability of this uh, really critical platform uh, for us and for all of the folks who are at similar institutions. Thanks so much. I love that. Thanks, Kate. Oh, and I should point out, so um, with our membership levels too, um, since as of uh, the end of January of this year, uh, the very large institutions has been at 57. Um, and for Kate, large institutions has been, we have had 42 large institution members. So that's great. Hi, I'm Maggie Hughes. I work at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, and I'm the archival processing manager there. Um, I'm the board rep for the medium-sized institutions and started my term of service last summer in 2023. Um, previously, I served on uh, TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee. Um, I think that was from 2017 to 2021, 2020 maybe. Um, and I'm really excited to be on the board now and have sort of very, like a, a different perspective on things, but um, still very complimentary to my experience on TAC. And I've um, been involved with the adoption of archive space at several different institutions at UCLA and then also at the Huntington. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Maggie. Hi, I'm uh, Kat Stefko. I'm the Director of Special Collections and Archives um, at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. Uh, I am actually on my second rotation on the governing board. I served originally from 2018 to 2011. And I am uh, filling in for a one-year um, gap position that was available. And I've been delighted to be back on the board. Uh, it has been actually a really interesting um, means of comparing sort of where Bone was previously and where we are now with archive space implementation, um, where we were at the previous time of my tenure, just sort of early stages of implementing. And now we're at the, I would say, bleeding edge of trying to um, keep up with all the new features and think about what we want to advocate for. So that's been really interesting. It's also been really great to see just the maturation of the governing board itself um, and the relationship with lyricists. So I've, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to sort of come back and see how things are going. Thanks, Kat. And the small level members, um, there are 108 small level institutions right now at this point um but to be outdone by that we have <laughs> hi i'm linda hawking um i'm the archivist at the litchfield historical society um and i am in my first year on the governance board i served previously on um, the uac and um i'm just learning about what the operations of the board are and if you um are in this category and you think there's something that the board could help you with, or you know, you'd like to advocate for, I hope you'll get in touch. Thanks, Linda. Yes, uh, Linda's representing over 200 very small institutions. So of course we, um, it's really important for us to be able to have representatives from every membership level, especially people that might not um, have the same amount of resources as someone at a very large institution. Um, our other members, so there's two, um, two founding institutions that are here as project partners that always have a seat on the board. Um, we have Austin Booth, who represents New York University. She's been on the board since 2018. And then Eric Mitchell, who's the university librarian at the University of California, San Diego. Um, he's been on the board since 2018, and he's actually currently um, the vice chair of the board as well, but he was unable to attend today. Um, we have a couple of non-voting members, as I mentioned. So first. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie Benefiel. Um, I am the University Archivist and Digital Collections Librarian at Grand Valley State University. Um, I served on the governance board um, as a voting member and the medium sized institution representative from 2020 to 2023. Um, 
wait, 2024. <laughs> and I uh, and I also served as chair of the board for that last year. Um, so right now I am serving on the board at, as an ex officio member as the past chair. And I'm also chair of the nominating committee this year and chairing the code of conduct review task force. Awesome. Thanks so much, Annie. Um, Hi, I've been talking at you for 10 minutes now. Um, I'm currently the digital archivist at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, prior to that, I was the senior archivist at the Strong National Museum of Play, also here in Rochester. Um, that's a small level member institution. RIT is a medium level institution. So once I moved institutions, I could no longer be the small level member rep uh, because I was no longer at a small level institution. So Kat uh, graciously um, accepted um, our our plea to rejoin the board, which was wonderful. So yes, I'm the current chair of the board, but I'm not voting. I'm not a voting member because I am not representing um, my constituents in the, in any membership level right now. Uh, but this has been such a wonderful experience just getting to, you know, getting to have a stake in, in how archive space is running and getting to know all of these wonderful people and all of these wonderful um, projects that we've had. So that's been great for me my end. Um, and then our other non-voting member is um, Lori Gemmel Arp, who is the at Lyricist, and she is um, our organizational home representative, and she's been um, with us on the board since 2023, but Lori knows and does everything, and she's incredible. Um, so we're just so pleased to have her on our board as well. So as for TAC and UAC, I think that um, sometimes this seems a little bit mysterious to some people too, if you haven't been involved in that. So I would love for um, for my for our chairs to be able to chat a little bit with everybody too. So from the Technical Advisory Council. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rachel Searcy. Um, I'm the Accession Archivist at New York University. And I also am the primary archive space administrator here. Um, so I've been on the Technical Advisory Council since 2020. Um, I've been on the sub teams that work on testing and the technical documentation. And um, this year I'm the chair of TAC. And um, just kind of briefly, uh, sort of the reasons I wanted to get involved in TAC were that I was hoping that being more involved in this way would sort of help me at my a uh, day job, um, kind of being that administrator, and it has, um, you know, testing the application multiple times has just made me much more comfortable and fluent with it, including like functionality we don't use or functionality that hasn't been released yet. So that was hugely helpful. Um, I also work a lot on NYU's local documentation. So kind of seeing Another perspective on the archive space technical documentation has been um, hugely beneficial. Um, and then as far as being the chair of TAC, um, I thought it might be a helpful way to kind of um, improve my supervisory skills. Um, you're really there to support the different sub teams doing their work. So um, it's an opportunity or it has been an opportunity to grow in things like, you know, how to run a meeting and uh, facilitation and, you know, just kind of being aware of what people need and knowing how to provide that for them. So it's been um, a really great experience. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And then from the User Advisory Council. Hi, I'm Suzanne Reller and I am the current chair of the User Advisory Council. Um, I work at the University of Cincinnati as a reference and collections librarian, but I manage our archive space instance. Um, I am in my third and final year on um, the User Advisory Council. And of course I'm chair this year. Um, one thing uh, great about the University Advisory Council is uh, that we work to facilitate, to facilitate communication between the archive space user community and the archive space governance board. Uh, we currently have 18 members on um, UAC who serve on three sub teams and two joint sub teams. Awesome, thank you so much, Suzanne. All right, 
So a little bit about some of our recent initiatives and discussions. So um, speaking for the board, um, we are continuing our diversity partnership. So if you're not familiar with that, it was begun in 2021 as kind of a three-year pilot program. So the Archive Space Diversity Partnership offers you know, support for implementing the application to institutions who are themselves or primarily serve communities um, that are typically underrepresented underrepresented in the archive space community. So these participating organizations, they receive archive space membership, hosting and technical support from a registered service provider, um, introductory and specialized training, and then ongoing user support. Um, and then as of the 2024 program, they also receive some consultant hours um, for use to, you know, migration and workflow development and other activities that will kind of help with implementing archive space. Um, and all of this is at no cost to that diversity partner institution. So we're, we're really excited to continue that. Um, so eligible organizations um, include academic minority serving institutions, such as historically Black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, um, and Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions. Um, this is also for nonprofit or community archives primarily run by or serving Black Indigenous um, people of Black and Indigenous people of color, um, as well as tribal archives too. Um, we have also recently our Code of Conduct Review Task Force, and I was hoping Annie could um, give us an update on that. Maybe she stepped away. So um, with the code of conduct review, so the archive space code of conduct um, is obviously something that we all strive to follow. Um, there was an, an incident in the past that came up that we have decided uh, warrants a review of that code of conduct. And we have some um, some members serving on that task force to, um, to study the, our code of conduct, to work with a consultant about um, other potential um, materials other potential lines that we could incorporate into that sort of thing. And that's something that's ongoing and something that's very important to us here on the board. And um, once we have more info on that, we'll be happy to share that with everybody too. Um, and also, um, as I mentioned, so with our with our quarter three board meeting, we tend to take like the second day and um, do kind of an activity together. So for the last few years, we've actually followed the It Takes a Village Toolkit. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, um, that's a reference source and adaptable set of tools that kind of helps um, open source software programs that serve cultural and scientific heritage organizations plan for long-term sustainability. Um, so this year, the, the board, we met and we took on kind of um, working through one of the activities. So activity 20, that's um, developing a plan to expand community participation and governance. Um, that aligns very well with today's session, in fact. But um, this group, we considered, you know, incentives and maybe barriers to participants and participation, as well as like the types of skills and expertise that we think would be really um, useful to have on, on a governance board or within um, our active committees here in the archive space community. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we're able to, you know, encourage participation at all levels for everybody and how other people can, you know, contribute to um, to all sorts of uh, programs that we're doing here with archive space. So um, we also chatted about, and, and this is very important to us too, is making sure that we can increase the diversity and equity of our governance board as well. I'm gonna pass on to my, uh, to, to um, Rachel with TAC with some of their um, their recent initiatives and discussions. Yeah, so um, this year we've been kind of focusing on a few different things. Um, we've been experimenting with uh, different sort of meeting formats to make our monthly TAC meetings more meaningful and engaging for people. So we've had a few guest speakers, um, We've done sort of working meetings where like the individual teams can go into breakout rooms um, and we've done some other activities. So um, kind of get a sense at the end of the year, like what people thought about those, what they liked and want to do again and what they maybe didn't. Um, the other thing is we want to focus on the experience of being on council. Um, volunteer professional service is can be a lot of work. Um, it's not particularly visible. 
and it's not always well recognized, including like at your home institution. So um, just kind of wanting to honor the work that people are doing um, and make sure that they're um, make sure that they're being valued for that. So we did an activity on like, how do you talk about your professional service on Archive Space Council and like the ways in which, you know, it's helped you grow or experience you've gained. Um, and then lastly, we are also emphasizing um, continuity between terms and uh, maintenance on the work undertaken in prior terms. So this is definitely a continuation of um, themes from a few years ago where we really started to dig into this. But, you know, thinking about, um, you know, how do we set the next year up for success and not having them kind of start things over? How do we take care of the things that we've created? So I will pass it along to Suzanne, I think. Yeah, so on uh, UAC, we've been um, focusing largely on communication and collaboration. So um, we've tried to increase communication among the sub teams, um, having some regular sub team lead meetings um, and um, communicating that also facilitates communication between myself as chair and our sub team leads. Um, we've also continued to explore uh, collaboration between our sub teams and outreach to the user, um, archive space user community from our sub teams. There have been a lot um, of sub team initiatives, <laughs> I understand too. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to just give a sort of bird's eye view of what the different teams are doing because really a lot of the majority of the work of council takes place in these individual sub teams. So we just kind of wanted to give an overview. So on the tax side, um, the integration sub team is actually sunsetting as an active team after a few years of realizing that this wasn't really something that needed to be like an active um, active group anymore that you know we want to maintain their documentation and we'll, we'll be comfortable with that. Um, metadata standards, um, they're continuing to work on the EAD and MARC importers and exporters that I know a lot of us in the community rely on, um, and that they're going to also be looking to solicit feedback on metadata use cases from the wider community. So that's going to be happening later in the spring. Um, the technical documentation group is uh, focusing on sort of routinizing and regularizing the processes for maintaining the, um, the GitHub repository that is where all the technical documentation lives. Um, and yeah, that, that's all the tech people. So um, Suzanne will talk about the UAC and the cross council groups. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have three um, UAC sub teams. Um, our member engagement sub team, um, their primary work has been involved in um, leading the member match program, but they also recently started a new monthly event called Take a Break with Archive Space. So uh, look out for those invitations. Our usability sub team. Um, They've been continuing work on the multilingual description um, initiative. Um, they did a survey you may have seen in the past on a community survey on multilingual dis description functionality, and they're assemb assembling an advisory group of community, community members to document use cases for that project. Um, user documentation um, is our third sub team. They continue to maintain and update the user documentation and the Archive Space Health Center that people may have used regularly. Um, they recently updated that documentation for their latest Archive Space release. And they're currently also reviewing the public user interface documentation in the manual. Um, in addition to that, the ones that Rachel talked about in the UAC um, subteams, we have two joint subteams, um, development prioritization. Um, they um, have been focusing on community engagement for particular feature requests. And over the last year, they've reviewed 68 JIRA tickets. Our testing sub team um, continues to perform regression testing on new releases, including the latest release. 
3.5.0. And um, they've tested 26 individual bug reports and feature requests this year. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. So now's the time that we're going to kind of get into a panel discussion um, about some topics, just kind of like a little loose chat between um, some of our members of the governance board and also our TAC and UAC chairs here. Um, so our very first question is, how did you get involved with the Archive Safe community? Um, I can I can go first. So um, I started using our hope space in 2015 when I was at the Strong Museum, um, essentially as a loan arranger there. And then I, within a few years, was on the nominating committee for Archive Space um, for a term, which was really useful for me to get to know different organizations and what all of these terms meant. What does different level of membership actually mean? What are um, the actual, you know, what are ways to actually get involved with the community? Um, and after the nominations committee, I did a stint on the user advisory council. Um, I was on a couple of different sub teams there uh, reporting, which I think might no longer exist. Um, and then also I did um, the testing as well, which was very interesting because, again, as a as a loan ranger, I didn't have a lot of need for some of these things, but it was really interesting for me to get to learn these things that I that I wouldn't have had a chance um, to do otherwise. And then after my uh, my three years with the user advisory council, um, I ended up joining the end up being elected to the to the governance board. And so um, you have a you can serve, I think, two separate three-year terms consecutively. Um, I'm in my first three-year term as voted in as a small level member, um, which I served from uh, 2021, I think, gosh, uh, to, to the present. Um, and then last term, last year, I was the vice chair under Annie. And then this year, I am the chair. And then next year, I will um, cycle into being past chair and continue being ex officio and serving with the nominating committee. So very exciting stuff. I've got to, I've got to learn a lot and um, experience a lot of things that I wouldn't have otherwise just working in my position and just using archive space as an application. So um, again, opening the floor to everyone else um, here on this panel, how did you guys get involved with archive space and what was your journey? <laughs> So um, I started in 2013, I think it was, as we were, Litchfield um, was an inaugural member, and I was asked to be on the UAC then. Um, so I think, if I remember right, it was on the documentation sub-team. And, you know, like you said, Julia, it was really great to be able to have conversations with other people using this tool, which at that time was really new. Um, and to understand why certain language was used in fields and you know other kinds of things like that. So that's my story. <laughs> awesome, thanks Linda. Um, I could share a little more. So I joined TAC when I worked at um, UCLA and I was encouraged or like suggested maybe I should consider um, submitting my name uh, by a coworker. And I'm so glad they did suggest that because I wasn't an expert. I still don't feel like an expert in archive space, but I think um, I think Rachel said something like this. It's your experience helps your job so much. Like there's so much more that I'm just aware of with archive space that's going on. Um, you know, development coming or bugs that are being worked on. Um, that's really complimentary to, to my position. And though I've switched institutions, you know, so many places use archive space. Those are skills and experience you can take with you. It's really valuable. And I didn't realize so many of the current board members used to be on UAC or TAC. I think that's, that's really cool to see um, that that involvement's continued in different ways. Thanks, Maggie. I can move on to the next question if I don't have a another taker. Um, so yeah, what has been your experience on UAC or TAC or the governance board, and how and sharing that with um, with the community? Maybe things that 
um, you've experienced that are real benefits, um, things you learned about that you hadn't had the experience with before? Well, I can say for uh, my experience on UIC, I have learned so much about archive space. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people um, maybe out there who haven't served think you have to know everything to put your name in, to, to nominate yourself to be on one of these groups. And um, I I served initially on the testing sub team and it really, um, was an opportunity to learn about features that we don't use at our institution that I could implement if we wanted to. Um, it gave me opportunity to preview new features. Um, so um, I've just really learned a lot and met a lot of people who I've learned to have some of the same issues that I do too. Super, thank you. Um, I can share a little. Um... Yeah, I feel like kind of building off of what a few other folks have said, just like a level of sort of like confidence and sort of like a um like a closer understanding of like what's actually happening um in terms of like I feel a little bit more confident like talking to my developers at NYU about like the things we need, even though they're things I can't do or don't really understand like I feel like I'm able to meet them like halfway a little bit more um and also just kind of understanding the ecosystem of this application I think also like I have a better sense of like what's possible and how to you know you know if we're we discover something that is you know a frustration like we could submit a feature request to have that changed as opposed to like feeling like kind of helpless or like that's the way it is. So just kind of like a little bit more agency. Um, and I'm also, you know, being on council has really made it clear to me just like how much work it takes to support an application. Um, you know, I remember Archivist Toolkit <laughs> and the kind of like last days of it where it was, you know, not being supported anymore. And you know, you got what you got and you had to deal with it. Um, and the kind of like sustainability that is required for an open source application is not insignificant. And it, you know, requires a lot of people to contribute to that effort. But um, I often think back to like that purple archi or archivist toolkit bug report every time. It's like, this is why we need it. This is why we kind of need to work together to kind of continue to make it a viable um, program for people to use. Absolutely, that like the word sustainability just really, you know, we have to keep highlighting that. Our, our membership and people's willingness to be involved and to serve um, on councils and communities and things like that is really what helps to keep us running. Um, I know that it's, that yes, we're, we're doing this as kind of like volunteer service toward um, toward the community itself, but everybody's making an impact. Everybody is um, is doing just like such a good job keeping us running. And I mean, I think we're one of the great like open source platforms that you can point to that has this really robust, um, enthusiastic community and with people that wanna be involved in these sorts of things. Um, from like my point of view too is, so like, again, being on the UAC and seeing how some things run and then like kind of shifting into the governance board, it is a different like behind the scenes, you're getting more about um, the operations of the program itself. Again, like learning how to read a budget and learning how to read like a, you know, um, the financial reports and things like that is actually a really important skill. And it, it, is, it was wonderful. Like Lori Arp like talked us through it, which was amazing. Like, this is what this means. And this is why this is this color. And this is what this column means. And like, you don't always get that. Sometimes your administrators just will throw a budget at you and you're like, I don't know what I'm looking at. So, um, I mean, even just things like that has just been, um, I think really useful for me. Um, you know, again, getting to serve in leadership roles, getting to, um, you know, run meetings and meet people and network and all that kind of stuff has been wonderful too. But I think that like have, knowing that um, things that we decide and things that um, that are proposed to us from community members really make an impact on, on archive space, I think has been just so, so valuable to me. Other board members want to, want to bring anything up about, um, 
benefits to serving on the board or um, other great things that you've experienced? Yeah, I so I'm much newer to the board maybe than a lot of folks. So I'll speak mostly to kind of what motivated me to be on the board um, and why what I'm really excited about in terms of the board and, and the kind of governance structure of archive space. So I, you know, was already, I have drunk the Kool-Aid of shared governance. I'm like, I'm there. Um, but I also have experienced some really um, not great uh, open source solutions that we've used in a variety of different context contexts over the course of my career, sometimes in a consortial context as well. Um, and I think um, just seeing how much archive space and lyricists are focused on like truly making shared governance a core value of how the system is actually overseen and managed and developed and made to be sustainable financially. It's so hard to do well. And it's just, I think it, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate it and how much I'm, um, again, excited to be part of it because um, it's really rare to see a system that is open source and really community led and really kind of both financially and and kind of in a governance sense sustainable. Um, and I think that only works if we are, um, as much as we have capacity to do so, are all invested in its, its continued sustainability. Awesome, thank you, Kate. So moving to our next question, if my pointer will allow me to. Um, and this is something that that came up when we were kind of discussing this with our uh, Takes a Village Toolkit in the quarter three board meeting. Um, what does everyone kind of perceive as potential barriers to people for participating in governance? Um, I have some thoughts, but I'd love to hear some other people. <laughs> Time probably is a huge barrier. Um, I don't know, speaking from a very small institution, um, I'm the only archivist and we have a staff of five and we run two museums, a research library and an outdoor community space. So there are definitely other things I could do with my time, but I think um, it's still, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't not do it. It's a really valuable experience. Um, for all the reasons everyone has stated. Um, but if you can possibly spare the time, I think it's worth it. Um, and I think, you know, just going back to what Maggie said about not feeling like you're an expert, which I think might be another barrier. Um, I also feel that way. And I, I, I feel like most of us probably feel that way because it's a huge application and there are a lot of variables going on there. Um, we don't have tech support on staff. We don't have developers. Um, and yet nobody in my experience on UAC or on the governance board or on the message boards or anything has ever been in any anything but kind about my lack of knowledge of anything. They just try to help you. So I would say if you can um, if you can possibly spare the time, it's worth the effort. Yeah, that was perfect, Linda. Thank you. I, yeah. I, I'll jump in and say that when I, on my first rotation on the board, there was an expectation of physical travel at least once a year. And um, I'm really glad that the board has decided not to reinstate that because that was a, I think that was a real barrier, including um, it was the expectation that board members would, you know, pay their own way or their institutions would. And that's not an equitable, that's not equitable. So I am deeply grateful that that's gone away. And I think it does open up um, the possibility of other people serving or more people serving. Um, I just would like to say that I think one of the, um, in my mind, the, the potential conflict was going to be the amount of preparatory time needed to be a board member. And while there is time needed, it is mitigated to such a great extent by how well prepared the lyricist staff are for these board meetings. Um, information is so well packaged, it's gathered, it's interpreted for us. I think it really reduces a lot of the barrier that otherwise um, would make it difficult, not only to agree to serve, but to be a full participant in the meetings. And I'm very grateful for that. 
That is so true, Kat. Um, yes, our partners at Lyricist are incredible with that. They are like, hey, Julia, can you send out an email about this thing? No rush. And it's like, oh my gosh, if you hadn't reminded me that I need to do that, then I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't just wouldn't have happened. So they're so good about being like, you know, about keeping us running, about keeping things going smoothly. They know that we're volunteer, you know, technically kind of volunteering our time with this too. And um, that they're making things as easy as they can on us. So I appreciate that, Kat. Absolutely. And then one last discussion before we open the floor to everybody. Um, so yeah, uh, board members, and then of course, um, TAC and UAC chairs, do you have any advice about um, participation in these sorts of things for, for any members that are attending this session? I'll chime in. Um, if you are even remotely interested in um, serving archive space uh, in governance or on one of the councils, um, please consider responding to our upcoming call for nominations. Um, you know, I think um, my colleagues here have described um, the benefits that they have received from uh, from serving and also the, the benefit to the community and to the application um, of of member engagement and member support. Um, don't, yeah, don't, I just don't hesitate. Like we definitely need you. <laughs> you don't have to know everything. Um, and it is an incredibly um, supportive environment in which to grow and learn as a professional. Um, and yeah, if you're, if, if you're thinking about it, Definitely put your name in the hat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna co-sign what Annie just said. Um, yes, if you're if you're thinking about it, you might as well just do it. Throw your hat in the ring. <laughs> and with that, um, we have about five minutes left for um, community Q and A here in this session. So we are your governance board, are your member level reps, and our TAC and UEC chairs are here to um, answer any burning questions you have that maybe have come out of this presentation or um, or otherwise. So um, please feel free to just you know unmute and ask a question, and I think we'll we'll be able to figure it out. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself to ask your questions. But if you'd rather drop it into the chat, I can read those questions out loud for you. But um, definitely encouraged to unmute yourself and participate. Thanks, Jess. I have a question. When exactly is the next nomination period? Do you have that date yet? Well, I know Annie does. <laughs> we will be sending out the nomination, a uh, call for nominations very soon, probably the first week of April. Um, and we'll be um, probably accepting nominations um, during the month of April and into the first week of May. And you're welcome to self-nominate. You don't just have to, um, you know, nominate somebody else at another institution or whatever. You're welcome to throw your, to throw your own name in too. <laughs> and how long is the service time? I think it is three years for governance board, and I think it's now three years for UAC and TAC as well. That recently changed, I recall, because that changed while I was on TAC. Yes, I believe that is correct. I think it extended from two to three years. I will also say for anybody else who's on here who's at an academic institution, which is a lot of us, um, this is a great opportunity to show evidence of national and potentially international impact in uh, service of a, a promotion. Um, I'm not going to say that I was entirely motivated by that, but it didn't hurt. Thanks, Kate. Well, if there are no other questions right now, um, you can reach out to any of us at any time. We are, 
you know, our, our all of our information, I think, is on the Archive Space website. Um, please feel free to reach out anytime with any questions. Your level member, your level membership representatives are, are here to take care of your specific institutions. But of course, um, anybody should feel free to bring anything to the board at any time, um, as well as the other committees. So um, we just want to thank you and thank you again to my fellow um, to my fellow panelists here, um, everyone who helped put it put this presentation together. And um, yeah, we just want to make sure that everybody, you know, everybody understands that you, everybody can participate. It doesn't matter um, your your level of experience or your, you know, are you at a very small level member institution? I mean, I know that that can be a little intimidating um, if you're dealing with people that are working at like Yale and Harvard or things like that, and you haven't had that experience before. But um, I think everybody here is very welcoming and very friendly. And um, we just want to, we just want to keep archive space and make it as successful as we still can and keep our membership um, sustained and growing. So um, I guess with that, Jessica. Yeah. I, uh, Thank you, Julia. Yeah that, yeah, that was a great ending. So I'm sorry to do this to you, but we have a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if um, is there a general email if you want to reach the board specifically? Yes, we have a listserv, don't we? <laughs> I th the listserv is internal to the board. I think oh, okay. that, yeah, I think. I was going, I would guess that archive space home at lyricist.org is the best way to get in contact with the board, but I wasn't sure if there was a preferred way. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Or um, if people want to email me, um, I'll drop my email in the chat and I'm happy to bring things to the board. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank so you. thank you, Julia. Thank you to uh, the rest of the governance board and um, to Rachel and Suzanne for representing TAC and UAC. Um, we are going to go ahead. There's and one more question in the chat. Sorry, Jessica. Oh, sorry. Um, oh. I think if, if Ra Rachel, maybe you can answer that question yeah. specifically in the chat or if you want to answer it out loud, but it's about um, yeah. the tech doc subcommittee and how the teams update their documentation. So that that may be better to take into the chat or if you want to go ahead and answer it now. I can just free. answer briefly yeah. and then Corey, if you want to follow up with me later, we can talk more. Um, the tech docs has kind of um, changes a little bit from year to year, depending on the makeup of the sub team. Um, most of the documentation is written and edited by the Archive Space program developers, but anyone can contribute to it through a pull request um, through the GitHub repository. And over the years when we've had um, people on the sub team itself who have the comfort and expertise to edit documentation, they have done that. So it's a little bit of everything, um, but I'm happy to talk more. And I know the API, API documentation has been um, a subject of interest for many years. So um, feel free to reach out. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, yeah. All right. So we'll go ahead and move into our break portion now. So we are going to take a 10 minute break. We will reconvene at five minutes after the hour. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we It is five minutes after the hour, which is when we were going to return from our break. Uh, but I see that we have some people who are joining right now. So let's give it a few minutes uh, for those that, that stepped away and left the room to come back in before we get started with our next session. So let's, let's take another um, maybe three minutes before we get started. Hello to everyone who is joining or rejoining the room now. We're going to uh, wait another two minutes before we get started on our next presentation. So uh, you will be hearing silence for the next few minutes as others join. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to go ahead and move on with our next round of content. So um, let's see. I think Brian is here. Hey, Brian. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And Brian, feel free to go ahead and share yours. And I can read your session description while, while that's happening. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so next up, we have Brian Zellup, the front end developer for Archive Space. He's presenting Modernizing the Archive Space code base. This lightning talk provides a high level technical overview of recent and ongoing upgrades to Archive Space that improve security, performance, and other modernization efforts. So, Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much. You can hear me, I assume, yeah? Yep, I can hear you and see your slides. Right now, they're up in presenter mode, so if you have any notes, we'll also be able to see those. Okay. I don't even want to be in this, but let's just do that. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Brian Zellup, and uh, I've been working on the team officially uh, for the past almost two years and did some contracting work uh, before that for a few years as well. So I've had a chance to um, grow with the application and really see uh, quite the breadth of it of the code base, which is pretty big um, as a, as an application goes. And recently, we've been uh, doing some work uh, that's done some really uh, new, useful additions and changes to the code base. Some of the stuff, uh, a lot of the stuff, actually, is is almost unnoticeable visually uh, from a user's perspective. It looks the same, it, but uh, some of the changes include um, the functionality changes. There'll be some improvements in just kind of the usability of it. Uh, and there's some other sort of 
security things that have been changing too. Um, uh, and so just as a high level overview, one of the big things that have changed for folks um, who may have heard of some of these things or folks who represent staff who are hosting archive space at their institution, um, some major upgrades have happened that have been needed for a long time uh, and sort of a long time coming. Um, uh, and these changes actually uh, aren't yet in a released version. These changes will be coming in the next release. We just are off on the heels of version 3.5, which has been released as a release candidate. So that's almost out. Uh, and it's up there for people to, to play around with and check out and test. Um, the next version that comes out after that is going to include these really uh, big monumental changes that we see here, um, starting with, with, with Ruby on Rails, which is sort of the underlying templating engine that the server sends when the server sends HTML down to a, either a staff user who's using the staff backend or an, an archive patron who's using the public uh, front end. Um, this is what is doing most of that heavy lifting. And uh, from 5.2 to 6.1 doesn't sound too much, uh, mathematically speaking, but this represents some significant changes um, to uh, some security patches, um, as well as some performance increases and improvements, um, and all around better development experience too, for those uh, people who maintain plugins for archive space, and people who, you know, uh, in the open source community may fix some bugs and for, for our development team as well, of course. Uh, another one is uh, this big one, this jQuery. This is, a, this is actually the major one in, in, from my perspective because this is really old, uh, 1.12. Uh, and this again is only a couple of different points mathematically, but uh, major, major uh, upgrades, in, especially in a lot of, uh, there's some security patches that don't, they haven't really, uh, they've affected the, they've alerted the institutions that host archive space um, and made them worried that uh, it's such old um, versions of these libraries that are being used. Uh, and it's true that some of these older versions and, you know, software has bugs, um, but not all bugs uh, represent uh, problems because of the ways that applications are used. Uh, however, this has been a, a multi, multi-year need, uh, you know, six, seven years plus that this um, has sort of been an issue. Uh, and this is finally coming down the pipe uh, on the next archive release. And this has some, some you know, kind of edge case security improvements, um, but a whole lot of uh, changes to the developer experience, particularly, um, and, and other kind of things. And finally, one of the things that's also changing is sort of the, the paint on archive space, Bootstrap, uh, which is the CSS styling library, the, the system that is, is sort of the de facto design system that archive space is kind of built on visually, um, and in some cases, uh, behaviorally. Um, and this is big, one of the really big improvements here, again, not that big of a difference mathematically, but uh, at, at Bootstrap 3.3, .3, uh, it was a much more immature uh, library, uh, especially accessibility wise. So one of the things um, that we're getting now coming the next release is a bunch of new sort of newfound strengths uh, in accessibility throughout the application, just sort of by doing these upgrades of upgrading the library and adjusting the markup accordingly to use the new, the new way that you use the, the library because uh, there's been some changes from this version to this version. So this has actually been a, these two things in particular, I mean, actually these whole, this whole dependency upgrade project has been over three years in the making. Um, uh, I think if I recall correctly, uh, this work was, um, Archive Space was working with a contractor in 2001, sort of around this time, 2001. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, within the last six months, it was handed off from them to the Archive Space team 
And we have been running the extra mile uh, to, to close that final 20% uh, that they got it to. They got it kind of the 80% of the way. And I've, we've been crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. Uh, and that's what we're getting ready for next year. So this is for next release. So this has been a, a long time coming. Um, and, you know, that's a long time. Uh, and that kind of gives you an idea of the challenge of archive space development, it's, it's breadth. Uh, and when you combine that with its age and the fact that being an open source uh, project in an academic, in the academic community um, where funding is sometimes a, a concern and a question, um, the, the, there's not always a, as, as, detail to handoff from developer to developer it's getting developed over time by different groups of people who may or may not be in communication with each other and that proves to be difficult uh especially when you have something as large as archive space which is kind of one thing in one sense but it's also kind of four different things in another sense four different applications too um so anyway this work has been a long time coming and it's coming down the pipe uh in the next release um and just to maybe kind of show you some stuff uh here where is it oops sorry um so again a lot of this work doesn't look a lot different right but already we can see here's the new version um and if i just go over here to the test version Already, we'll see. I'm already bumped up, and and so this is the default way that it currently looks. The application. This is the new one that's kind of coming down the pipe. We're already getting a little bit a bump a bump up in text. Um, we're starting to get the more accessible color contrast. That's another big thing that I love working in this new uh, code base. Um, it just looks crisper, and it's it's more. There's more color contrast. More of the WCAG accessibility guidelines are being met across the board now. Um, it didn't just happen as a result of changing Bootstrap, for example. We're, we've been doing a lot of work in uh, doing this long tail of, of issues that Archive Space has had for some, some time now. Uh, and that's all coming to a head here very soon. One of the other things, in addition to those library upgrades that we've been doing, our dependency upgrades, we've also been changing, sort of rewriting underneath the hood, the way that Archive Space utilizes the browser's capabilities. And Archive Space has had a, a challenge of, has had a technical challenge for a long time in trying to create the application that it is, uh, namely, especially something like, um, Something like uh, the uh, good old Krispy Kreme, like the public interfaces collection organization, um, which is another word for like an infinite scroll. Um, so this is something that changed is 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 part of the upgrades, I believe, in version three point five. I think that's when this new thing is coming. Uh, and this looks pretty much identical to what it used to look like before version 3.5. But under the hood, um, it's utilizing the browser in a way that the original archive space could not have done when, when this was written, the collection organization was written, because the browser didn't have these kind of native capabilities that I've, I, I have now been able to leverage. So one of the persnickety things about the collection organization, especially for users, because this is on the public interface, um, is, you know, we would scroll down and um, this would be moving, this, uh, this sidebar would be uh, expanding as you would roll into new, um, scroll into new records here, this would be sort of in sync with this. And there'd be a lot of activity going on and this data, uh, this is a, like an infinite scroll, which is essentially like a Twitter feed or a Pinterest feed where you just keep scrolling down and more information gets loaded to the browser from the server 
as the user scrolls towards the bottom of the content that already has been downloaded. So it's this constant communication back and forth with the server, sending, you know, potentially a lot of information. And so that can generally be slow, you know, on bad internet, on spotty internet, um, you know, et cetera. Um, and uh, this whole situation w w was often very awkward. Uh, and, you know, um, I understand how it was written, what, what was written before this new iteration. And my hat's my hat is off to to the collective authors who who created that, because they were fighting against a grain that you know something wasn't really created to do what it does. And archive space is its infinite scroll in this collection organization is is more challenging than a Twitter or a Pinterest infinite scroll, because Twitter and Pinterest only go one direction; they only scroll down, and so you always kind of know where you're at and what's coming next. But here you can, when we, you know, I'll just refresh this page again. When we come to it, this page for the first time, because there's a table of contents, a user could go somewhere way down deep in the collection. And then you, you suddenly you've sort of entered into it, not from the top, you've entered into it deep into the middle. And now you have potentially infinite stuff below you and potentially infinite stuff sort of above you, not obviously infinite, uh, it's all finite ultimately, but you get the idea. Uh, and uh, my hats go off also to Brigham Young University who helped by sharing some of their database with us to, and they had uh, you know, data with very deep many amount of children, uh, archival objects of, of a resource that I use to really beat up the code and find all kinds of problems with where it was at and uh, use their big data to uh, iron out a solution that really works across the board for everybody um, in a way that meets the write-ups about these problems in our JIRA, you know, in our tickets, the, in the way that archive space uh, and the technical committees and the dev prioritization committees, how uh, we have our JIRA workflow for bug reports and feature requests. Um, this new work has been uh, a rewriting of an old way, sort of a new plumbing that does the same thing, um, but makes a few changes like the sidebar is not in sync with this anymore for that jarring constant motion uh, and a few other things. Um, and again, this work was made possible because the evolution of browser functionality has increased over time and in the past few years has had significant improvements. And we are working on incorporating as much of the platform to do the heavy lifting as possible. Um, uh, be, and we're reversing um, the reliance on JavaScript heaviness. Uh, we're still gonna be relying on JavaScript to do a lot of things in archive space, but we are relegating some of the work that previous code authors had to use JavaScript for. Now we are relegating that work to the browser, which is a win-win for every everybody, uh, accessibility-wise, performance-wise, device age and capability-wise, um, et cetera. And, you know, battery-wise even, you know, is another big thing. Um, so those are, are kind of some, some of the improvements um, that have been going on and they're coming down the pipe and they it kind of follows suit with where we're headed and what we're thinking about as a development team and particularly you know plans that we have for future work after even this next next release is out of the way um, and i think uh, that can be about my time if there's any questions look um, thanks brian yeah right yeah, there, I see some questions about exactly. Uh, I know. Yeah, Brian. Uh, in other words, yeah, go ahead. If you can let me read the questions out loud for Sorry, the people that are sure. listening. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Um, yeah, but yeah, so there's lots of there's lots of comments in the chat. Where people are very excited by this, so I think that that's cool. Um, Kevin Claire is unreasonably excited, but I'll leave that where it is. Um, so we do have a question though. The first question is wondering why Bootstrap four instead of five? Just timing in the development pipeline. Yes, yes, because like I said, this was handed off to us. This was handed because uh, because timing, because this this work started in 2001. Bootstrap 5 wasn't out in 2001. Um, and so the consulting firm that did the initial the initial heavy lifting of that sort of initial 80 percent 
um, that's, that's where, that's where the world was at at that time. Um, and so that's the same reason for everything, including jQuery. Um, I mean, and, and Ruby on rails as well. Um, and it's particularly unfortunate in bootstrap because it was so close, you know, it, it was, it was comparable, but I understand why, you know, you, you know, there's, there was big API changes from bootstrap three to four, and that's what I'm going through, you know, kind of pulling my hair out, these very minute details all throughout the apps. Uh, and so there would be even, there would even be a continuation, you know, they already started that work and then to go to five. So that's just the way the cookie crumbles, but we're in a definitely a better situation going forward. And, you know, just to put it out there, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, archive space doesn't really have is something that it, more modern workflows and and teams employ these days is something called like a design system. Uh, that's really sort of a reference document. It's a kind of a living documentation for the components that make up your user interface. Um, and that there's no really, there's no real style guide to that kind of a thing in, in archive space. You just kind of look at other examples of it. And so there's a lot of drift all over the app and there's many, 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 many templates, you know, um, our, our developer, Don just did some math and, you know, there's something like a few hundred thousand lines of code in this application. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the reason why, and, you know, I, I've got ideas, you know, I'm, I'm sort of itching to do next upgrades, but of course we have a lot other, a lot of other tickets. I mean, these tickets in themselves float many boats. They, they solve many issues by doing these upgrades. But as you see, these upgrade upgrades like this also take a serious amount of time. So we won't be doing any kind of heavy lifting like this again soon, but I certainly have ideas uh, for the next time. And we've already been baking in, you know, best practices that'll help speed that process up come next time. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, so we do have a, another comment from Joshua Shaw. I, but I just really quickly want to point out a couple of times you said that the the contractor work started in 2001. It's 2021. So move slow, oh, but not right. that I'm slow. Sorry. So, yeah, whoa, yeah, no. Whoa, yeah, sorry about <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> um, uh, then uh, Joshua says, going off the design guideline idea, any plans for a UX review and changes to the UI, especially thinking of the staff search view and tables? Uh, that was Joshua's uh. <laughs> Got it. I, I think that's that's a great idea. I'm sure there's there's definitely a lot of tickets floating around that that deal with different parts of that elephant. Um, I'm not sure if there's uh, a a centralized ticket that really takes an in depth look and 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 starts some in depth planning. Um, you know that that would be a, you know, a function of a lot of the, the dev, dev pry and sort of feature request writing uh, processes of archive space uh, that we're also looking forward to and, and preparing and preparing for, et cetera. You know, that's always in the back of our, in, in, in our working practices as well, uh, preparing for things like that and making little improvements here and there, even if it's not the focus of a given work, you know, we, we do a lot of that, those kind of little improvements here and there uh, in the course of other work as well. Thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, so Christine chimed in. Uh, we have some recommendations from a previous task force that will be more possible now that these upgrades have uh, been done. She's going to send a link to that. Cool. Uh, but yeah, we did have a, a task force that reviewed the, the interface. So that will be dropped in the chat. Uh, we have one more minute. So if anyone has a question that can be answered in one minute please feel free to drop that into the chat otherwise i will say thank you very much brian um it's always fun to be able to see what's happening in real time and i appreciate you sharing that with the community um and no more questions have popped up so feel free to stop sharing your screen and to consider yourself done thank you again brian awesome thanks all i'm really looking forward to this next uh, this next talk too by the way yeah. so cheers all all right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So next up, um, Scott, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen while I read your introduction. Um, I'm also very excited about this presentation, but um, Scott, I'm going to apologize in advance. I used TikTok to help me with the pronunciation and I am sure that I got it wrong. 
Uh, but next up, we have Scott Ritten of the University of Edinburgh, who is presenting Tofar on Dulish and the Archive Space API. Tofar on Dulish is one of the most important Scottish cultural heritage collections, gathering together audio recordings of songs, stories, poems, radio shows, and beyond in English, Scots, and Gaelic. Recently, the University of Edinburgh Library took on the job of providing data to a new third-party front-end for TAD and opted to use the trusted and reliable archive space infrastructure to store this. Interactions between the website and archive space, archive space take place through the API. Scott will demonstrate the workflows they've undertaken to make this possible, including making audio recordings playable on the site and allowing multilingual aspects of the content. Scott? Thanks very much, <coughs> and your pronunciation was certainly no no worse than mine. Uh, I can say already. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Right. Um, so I'm I'm Scott Renton, uh, systems architect at the Digital Library at the University of Edinburgh, and I'd like to talk to you about an archive space use case that we feel is worthy of mentioning. And in fact, forgive us because we we've been meaning to do so for some time and, and just haven't got around to it. I'll explain to you what it is, what it does, and how we went about putting it together. So the collection in question is called Tober and Dulcis. Uh, for those of you that can speak Scottish Gaelic, forgive my pronunciation. Those of you that don't, then we can try it in the Scots tongue, uh, which is not much easier. There it's called Kiss the Riches. Uh, and in English, what that means is basically a deep well of wonderful content from which we wish to draw and drink our fill. So what's in this uh, this deep well? Well, to quote the site itself, uh, Tober and Dulcis, Kiss the Riches, is dedicated to the presentation and promotion of audio recordings of Scotland's cultural heritage through its website and subsidiary projects. It exists to make these recordings widely accessible and to create a broader and deeper understanding of its content, inspiring new, new research and creative work, educational opportunities and community engagement. So basically, what we're talking about is what has been described as the world's most important resource for audio recordings of Scottish cultural heritage from the 1930s onwards. The tracks therein might be songs or stories, poetry, concert recordings, interviews. You'll find performances from the prestigious singing competition, the Royal National Mod, uh, radio shows such as Jill and Jay, The Butterfly or Programme Honig. Songs from Jeannie Robertson, the Corries, the McCalmans, and interviews with traditionalists like Catherine Dix and Willie Matheson. You'll find some small mention of our national treasure, Billy Connolly, and you'll find plenty of Robert Burns, inevitably. And all of this is there with the goal of preserving as much rec uh, recorded content as possible for, for future generations. It's described in English. Scottish, Scottish Gaelic and the Scots languages, and it's the work of some very revered collectors such as Hamish Henderson, one of the foremost catalysts of the folk revival in Scotland, the ethnographer Callum Ian McLean, and the historian John Lorne Campbell. And where does the content come from? The vast majority is from the University of Edinburgh's School of Scottish Studies archives, and there's many a reel-to-reel -reel tape to be found in the AV suite up there. However, there is a uh, content from the BBC's Radio Nangale and Historic Environment Scotland's Canna collection and as a result it's administered by Tober and Dulcis, a separate body located at the University of the Highlands and Islands which ensures that all of the rights and licenses and usage permissions are adhered to across the full body of work. And Tober and Dilke's staff and steering group are run by people heavily inv involved and invested in the arts. Indeed, its director of development is Donny Munro, the former lead singer of Scottish Gaelic rock group uh, Runrig, who you may have come across. Tober and Dilke's isn't just about offering the collection to the public as a website. As you'll see by visiting toberandilkes.co.uk, uh, there's a lot of activity which goes on around the archive. The Projects tab will show you the short courses delivered at Salmo Rostig on the Isle of Skye around writing, creative pursuits with the content and so on. There's the Speak Gaelic project which is there to encourage people to learn the language. Uh, and there's an artist in residence, currently Ishmael Hendry. You'll also find tabs with uh, school support and a blog. So anyway, that's what uh, Tober and Dokus is. Let's move on to the project itself. So the first iteration of, of the website was built by the Applications Directorate at the University of Edinburgh 
in 2010. Its back end, the CAP system, is a bit older uh, and the first digital cataloguing was done uh, from about 2007. Its architecture hit end of life and the rescue site with a guaranteed short uh, stay was built by the Edina Directorate at the University in 20, around 2016, live in 2018. And around this time, the digital library of which I am a part started to get involved because we knew that Heritage Collections, which is affiliated to the, the library, were taking stewardship of the Scottish Studies Archive, so it became our responsibility to move the resource on for the foreseeable future. Archive Space was agreed to be the home of the data, but we did not agree to build the front end. A third party web development company called Primate, based in Edinburgh, took on that part of the job with the task of interfacing to Archive Space. The project team was pulled together from many disparate areas. And indeed, my colleague Chris Wright, officially the Scots Cataloguer of October, but at the same time, at the time of the project, senior user of the site is on the call today and is probably cringing at all of my inaccuracies as I go through this. So, why archive space? Well, we had a number of uh, architectural conver conversations to come up with the right approach. We had looked at a sort of standalone web app something else to to support and something that maybe would be a little bit flimsier uh, so that those sorts of things were considered but ultimately we came down on the thing that we we're most comfortable with uh, for stewardship of the data and uh, it, it put it puts the robust processes of care and maintenance that we need around the content and we understand that well uh, edinburgh were i think the, the first uk institution to adopt the tool in 2014 uh, and we quickly became consortium members and it's now the home of our prestigious archives the likes of which are listed here so we've got the Carmichael Watson uh, Folklore Notebooks which is um, accredited and UNESCO protected we've got the Charles Lyle Geology Scientific Notebooks he was a, a great uh, uh, idol of, of Charles Darwin uh, We've got the town planner Patrick Geddes's work, who uh, was all about making the lives of people in Edinburgh better. Burke and Hare, the grave robbers and murderers. We've got Lady Grange Letters from Captivity, the Lothian Health Service, and we've got the genetic stuff featuring Edinburgh's most famous alumnus, Dolly the Sheep. Um, and then we do have a lot of experience of, of building websites which interface to archive space data. Using a, a PHP framework, which we, which we call Skylight, we've been interfacing to uh, the archive space solar index since about 2015, I think, building sort of smaller websites which, which allow us to look at a resource in more, in more detail. So for things like the Regional Ethnology of Scotland project, the LHSA case notes, and once again, uh, the work of Dolly the Sheep. Um, so a lot of challenges uh, did need to be addressed in the project beyond simply migrating the data. I remember raising this in early 2020 and speaking to Christine about them over what was then the, the novel experience of a Zoom call. Uh, I didn't realise that all communication for the rest of the year would be conducted that way. Uh, so COVID compounded what were already abstruse technical challenges, but we did, like everyone else, get used to that way of working. Probably the most challenging aspect of the uh, Tobin and Dilke's site is the, the dual language bit, the, the toggle that all previous iterations of the website have had to allow users to see works delivered in Gaelic as well as English. Uh, but there's more to it than that. The, the search would have to be reliable and speedy, like you know anything that you're using an API for, you, you need to um, ensure that the the integration is, is, is good and fast. Uh, and we have issues and challenges around terms of use and things like that, making sure that users can't download the media and that sort of thing. Uh, there were challenges for the catalogers as well. They needed to be able to get data in quickly and efficiently. And, you know, Archive Space was a new tool to them. And to catalog by hand straight into Archive Space in the raw can be quite daunting. And another note, thing to note is that we, we have no public user interface on, on our Archive Space instance here because the, the front end, is to, the, the website is to be that and we didn't want to compound things with, with more complications. So the infrastructure itself was quite straightforward. Primate's website over here, Tobin and Dilkes Co UK, would interface to Archive Space using the API uh, and picking up archival objects for the tracks, digital objects for the digitised content, subjects and agents the uh, actual media would s can't sit in archive space because it doesn't hold media so that lives in a, a dspace repository uh, we've used dspace extensively at edinburgh uh, and 
they basically we we load into the uh, into D space using the the API, which creates in turn digital objects in archive space, and then they get attached to the archival objects themselves. Uh, we'd considered putting Tober and Delcus into uh, an archives into our main archive space as a, a separate repository, uh, <clears throat> but decided not to do this because. Uh, subjects and agents work across the whole instance and to allow Tober freedom over this content it was felt that a separate instance would work better obviously that gives us as a team more, more systems to support but it's something we know well and it's just doing the same thing again so it's not a big overhead uh, okay so the data structure is basically itunes via archive space if you can still say itunes in 2024 uh, archivists analyzed the data and came up with a mapping between the, the old rescue site and archive space to take into account all of the detailed field, fieldwork information that uh, had been captured against each track and tape. Once this was done, the de developer worked around the API in, in, in PHP to migrate everything in, and the process took about a week to run. Uh, and we managed to preserve the IDs from the old system to ensure continuity and successful persistence of old bookmarks. So that's something that worked well. The resultant data structure treated Tober and Dochus as one resource. Uh, data providers are, are stored below that level at sub uh, and then they have tapes the next level down uh, as series. So everything's archival objects below Tober and Dochus basically, that's the only resource fonds. Moving down, uh, tracks are uh, comprise the tapes, they are items and some of the tracks, uh, well, have, have digital objects against them, of course. Uh, there are about, to give you some figures, 17,000 tapes in there, comprising 100,000 tracks, 51,000 digital objects. So there are actually about, best part of half of the uh, content in archive space is metadata only content awaiting digitization. The, the, the stuff exists, it just needs to be uh, created uh, in, in digital form and put up. And uh, here's how it looks on the site. The search bar is there with a, a range of filters, including genres, uh, whether it show people or people or tracks, dates, content providers, and, and so on. And the search bar basically works with the solar syntax of the Archive Space API. And individual tracks look like this, and they're rendered and supposedly playable on the site. I'll see if I can get this one up. Uh, if we're lucky. Urs Ursu Swalit and Al Brandy Bottle. Ursu Swalit and Al Brandy Bottle. Ach, pooping tidily total. The more the bottle it's stuck in his throttle. Ach, pooping tidily total. I thought that was. Uh... I don't know if that actually came through, but uh, I thought if I was going to put something on, I'd go for something that was 19 seconds long and had one of the best names in the in the collection. Anyway, um, we, we then come to the, the, the things that we had to do to make it work. So the dual language aspect was tackled in a number of places. Uh, for agents, it's, it's made possible because we're able to store multiple name forms within one agent. So this example, Mary MacDonald, uh, is called Mary Donlach in Gaelic, and both will come through to the, the site. Uh, what actually happens there is that we, we see on a track, whether we're watching in English or in Gaelic, uh, in actual fact, the, the name here will still come up in, in the English form, but when we, when we click through, um, we can see on the Gaelic one that we are working with Mary uh, Von Lach, Don Lach, uh, and the other information there. So basically we were able to use multiple name forms to allow uh, dual language on the agents. Bit more challenging on the places on the subjects. This is a subject list on uh, one archival object. Uh, we can see we've got the item location of the village place of the Highlands and uh, I got, I'm going to stop trying in, in, in a second, uh, Gail Tacht, uh, for the Gaelic form. Uh, now, initially, when we'd been looking at this, we thought we would use the scope note to define the language that the item was coming through at, but uh, 
one of the archivists came up with quite a, a clever idea of using a, an external document which defined a key pair key basically so this tells us that we've got these two subject terms or two subjects made up of terms uh, 1703 and 1704 as a pair 1703 and 74 as a, as a pair here on the 1703 it's got english and the 1704 it's got gallic so the website knows when they pull that comp content through the api then they're able to show the relevant one in the right place and subjects do actually show that at track level so you can see their item location village place the highlands and over here get uh, who huspa etc right um you can tell i'm not a native um okay we will then look at media so this is what uh, an item looks like in the d space uh repository we we did uh it was uh the migration into d space again took about four or five days i think um running all the time using the dspace api called by from a python script basically and again generating uh, a record in there which is referenceable and you know stores the file uh, it's then referenced on the archival object uh, in archive space and then it goes on to the that, that obviously goes on to the archival object all gets pulled through and uh, comes through looking quite nice here with the old uh, waveforms there. Generally we have a one-to-one -one relationship between archival objects and digital objects. Um, the track is described and the mp4 of that track is attached and it's all very nice and clean but we do have continuation tracks where the track in itself is so big that it needs to be broken up and in this instance the continu continuations digital object will actually be sort of forced onto the parent records one so that all the bits of a track can be consumed on on one record in the website so that's been a, almost a, a manual process uh, to begin with but i think we've we've got that a bit more automated now uh, anyway that that uh, allows everything to, to be consumed in one place and then we've got images here's uh, jermaine mcbeth uh, giving a wee performance on stage here uh, the process would be again to create the record in in d space uh, and then write that reference to what was uh, then a biographical note in the agent record there may be a better way to do that now that we're on to version 3 because when we when we went live with this we were in version 2.8 and there wasn't so much uh, capability on the on the agents as there is now but um yeah that, that all works pretty well too okay uh so a lot of the work that's being done now uh is um around the around the system is, is being done using the api and archive snake to make people's lives a little bit easier as i said before cataloging was easier for the tober catalogers in the old system uh, and while we wanted to build a bolt-on app to make data and media entry easier there wasn't enough resource in our team to do so uh, so we we kind of uh, plodded along developing scripts based on the migration work to allow data and media entry and do some ad hoc data fixes and that got us through but then uh, chris um who was mentioned earlier on uh, and I'm, I'm just uh, being really really fawning to him today uh, picked he picked up the python and the archive snake ball and he just ran with it so he's now doing amazing things scripting around the, the api and as a result the development team's role is is somewhat um reduced which is you know it works for everybody because you know we, we only have a, a small amount of time that we can really devote to each each project that we work on um and so we we certainly commit to support archive space and the maintenance and getting the upgrades done and, and all that sort of thing but, but chris has been doing loads of work around the um you know the, the actual data with the api um and you know while that's that work has been helping colleagues no end uh, that there are still the, the the less technical ways and i think the spreadsheet upload is still very much an option for getting stuff in quicker which uh, we have looked at a little bit further development uh there's plenty coming up and that, that can be done on the site uh from performance perspective there are always challenges doing api calls um you're somewhat limited to how fast you can make it go but we can still look at solar and my my sql tuning etc we've probably given it about as much java heap spaces as we can before you start getting into diminishing returns but uh you know we're always uh, on hand to try and help 
Uh, but we do appreciate the, the, the nature of how a search works through the API and bringing it through to another, uh, another website is complicated and you can have a lot of API calls to do things and it does affect performance. So, you know, that that's, that's always something that we're mindful of and looking to improve. Uh, and there's certainly, um, for the searching, you know, the, the relevance is, is something that you can tune as well. Um, and we would like to get, you know, you know, I, I spend a little more time with solar, maybe just to see if there are other things we can do to um, to improve the relevance of the search as it comes up. Um, we talked a little bit about the uh, ease of data and uploading and cataloging. Um, and then we have, uh, we, we're actually moving out of DSpace and moving to a different data source using the archipelago system, which we're going to have for our main collections at Edinburgh. So that's a, that's a tool that's been developed uh, with things like IIIF and stuff like, like that in mind at the Metropolitan in New York. So we're taking that one quite soon and I think we'll move that, that data, uh, that content into there at some point. So we'll have a big update to fix that. Uh, and then we want to fix the this, what, what's currently working as a sort of direct read from DSpace. So it means that people are very clever, they can actually get at the MP3s and we, we're, we're fixing that just now to ensure that they can't do that. And then Chris has been working pretty hard on a, a georeferencing project at the moment using archive space data to to start building maps and uh, he's he's really I mean he says he's in the early stages but he's you know he's got this out already and uh, basically the larger the dot you can see there the uh, the more uh, items we have which uh, which relate back to that area so you know this has been a uh, this is the sort of thing that we, we like to see and see see it all moving on uh, all good for the, the site. So how's it going? Uh, I don't have any stats, unfortunately, but the, the site went live uh, in June 20, 2021, so it's been live for a little while now. Uh, <clears throat> the second phase of development improved the search. I've got all these things that are coming on, but we had a, a quote earlier on uh, from the guys themselves who said that they do know they're regularly outstripping their own records for unique visitors compared to the previous iterations of the Tobarandilka site. So we're obviously doing something right in that respect. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much all I've got to say. Uh, just to say that you can find the website at dobrindocus.co.uk. Uh, you can always contact me and my colleague Pat, who's also on the call, uh, through any of those email addresses if you get any questions about that. And Chris has uh, confirmed that if you've got any <coughs> any Tober specific questions or uh, anything around what he's doing just now, uh, you can contact uh, Chris there and Flory, the project director, is is also quite bad. I'm not giving you her uh, direct email address because I haven't actually asked her for it. Uh, the other websites that we've we've got the our main archives space sits so archives.collections.ed and these other three links are the uh, other sites that we have the interface to archive space data that I mentioned earlier on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Scott. That was. Fascinating. We have a few minutes for questions and there was so much going on. I imagine there are questions. Um, I was really excited to hear that Dolly the Sheep is represented in archive space. So that may be the most exciting thing I've learned today. Um, and uh, it was at the very end, just to drop in the work that's happening in the future uh, related to archive space data and, and mapping. That was that was really cool. Um, I very much hope and look forward to future presentations uh, from the University of Edinburgh. We do have some questions in the chat. Um, Marcella asked, do you know what tools or platform Chris is using for the georeferencing project? Um, right. Hello. Um, oh, yeah. great. You can't you can come <laughs> on. I was going to say. Really. <laughs> uh, it'd probably be easiest if I just answered that directly. Hi, I'm Chris Wright. I'm a, a folklorist and Scott's cataloger at Topin and Dulcus. Um, the uh, the georeferencing project, the, the work I'm doing just now is essentially leading up to uh, having the developer Primate have a stab at it. And I was basically trying to get a handle on what our data looks like to kind of mock up for them what we need it to do. So basically, I'm just, it's about 100 lines of code in Python. And it just uses, I think, the Plotly library in Python and just overlays uh, three data sets, which are all based on subjects. Um, the places are where things were recorded, where they talk about, and the native areas of the people that were recorded. And those are just overlaid and toggleable. Um, so there are about 4,000 places and 
three iterations of those in two languages. So it's it's fairly complex, but the actual code itself is is fairly straightforward. How that will be interpreted and then duplicated by the developers, uh, the professionals, to run um, in a web interface and a search, that's probably quite a different thing. So this is more just something for us to mock up, to be able to use in talks and, and things like that, and to get to get it straight in our head, what we're going to be asking the developers to do down the line. Thanks, Chris. All right, we have a few questions coming in. I, I want to acknowledge we are at time, um, but if if you're okay with it, um, uh, let's we'll give it five more minutes for Q and A. We and we'll still take our full ten minute break, and that will work out. Uh, so I'm going to read the three questions we have in the chat as long as uh, the team is okay answering the questions and has that five minutes, and then and then we'll go to break. But um, Megan asks, what was the driving decision to move from D Space to Archipelago? Okay, um, so we we've basically had uh, the collections collections platform at Edinburgh, which we built ten years ago, with uh, a D space backend and the Skylight PHP framework that was sitting on top of it. And I think really D space was never really intended, I think, for that that purpose. But it was what we it was what we had at the time where we sort of waited around to find somebody that would that would build a sort of uh, collections based thing that that was kind of more more around uh you know cultural heritage uh that then and I, I know there are many many dams that, that do that sort of thing uh but we were we were just we, we had a, a digital transformation which we're still going through and uh archipelago sort of came came to light as the thing that was ticking all the boxes from, from our perspective so we haven't moved yet um but but we we're we're very much behind what they're doing, and it's uh, you know it's an open source thing as well. Um, we were kind of using D space for everything, and it was part of the the digital preservation workflow that we had at the time. Uh, so that was what we were. Using. It was just the default thing to use. I think one of the I think our archipelago will will allow just slightly more. Um, a, you know a bit a bit more detail and a bit. Of, a, a bit of a nicer interface, I think, for for that kind of content. It, 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 it I mean, for this, it can really go anywhere. It just needs to be somewhere that the archive space can read it. But I think we're we're moving everything else to archipelago, archipelago so that, that will go as well. Thanks, Scott. Um, all right, I'm going to ask one more question, and we'll see where we are with time. Uh, Joshua asks, was there any discussion about dual or multilingual just language just data entry in object records? Oh, I bungled that. But multilingual description in object records. I'll I'll say I'll say a little bit. I mean, I, I know that we certainly, you know, that the the requirement that came, that came to us was was certainly around agents and subjects. I know that uh, titles have never have never fallen in that category, and I don't I, I don't know if Chris can can answer more about that because it may be. I, I seem to remember that in the rescue site, it wasn't it was never stored dual language, so uh, it, you you wouldn't have had the data. But is is there any you'd like to add to that? Um. So the, the the full project is bilingual. Uh, the old interface that was developed in the early 2000s was actually bilingual as well, depending on preference set by the user. The front end is meant to be as bilingual as possible. In terms of actually cataloging on the uh, in, in archive space, um, we have summaries in both English and in Gaelic. Um, and those are pulled through by reading the label of the note, uh, literally a summary English, summary Gaelic. That's how the the Gaelic skin on the website knows whether to present Gaelic information or the English information. So we do double up where necessary. And for example, with the places as well, every place has uh, an English and a Gaelic form, even if it's in a non-Gaelic area. There, there's a duality to absolutely everything. Uh, in archive space that we do for that reason. That's really interesting. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think this Q&A could go much longer, uh, but we are at time. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and say that we're going to move into our break. But there are still some other questions in the chat. If um, if anyone uh, from the University of Edinburgh team wants to tackle those, that would be wonderful. And I sincerely hope that 
um, you come back and, and keep us surprised of this project. It's really interesting. And there are so many different directions we could go in terms of this conversation. So thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say we are at break now. We are going to take a 10 minute break and then we will come back for our final block of sessions for the forum. So uh, we will reconvene at 10 minutes after the hour. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back to everyone who's joining us. Um, as a reminder, we ran a little over, so we're going to be taking our break until 10 minutes after the hour, or yeah, 10 minutes after the hour, so we have two more minutes before we come back. All right, welcome back, everyone. It's time for the last round of sessions for our member form. It's really exciting. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And Paul, if you'd like to go ahead and share yours while I read your introduction. All right, so Paul Sutherland of the American Philosophical Society is our uh, next presentation. He'll be presenting simultaneous audio collection processing and digital library uploading using Python, ArchivesSpace, and Islandora 8. The American Philosophical Society recently received digitized audio from a vendor of several large on unprocessed audio collections. They needed to find a way to simultaneously process the collection and archive space, upload to their digital library, and associate the two with minimal duplicated effort and tedious copy and pasting. Paul will describe a new internal workflow for archivists processing audio collections. The workflow involves using Python libraries to facilitate creating and uploading CSV and Excel files, validating metadata, retrieving information from file directories, and extracting and updating audio file metadata. The process is designed so that each of these steps can be applied in a Individually and combined into other workflows. Paul, take it away. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me correctly? Yes, we oh, can hear you and see your slides. Yeah. Oh, great, fantastic. Um, so yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you for introducing me. It's good to be here. Um, uh, so I um, just want to uh, get right into the talk. So um, yes, yeah, so um, we uh, we've received um, from our from an audio vendor um, a uh, large amount of recently digitized audio from collections that were unprocessed. Um, when when they came in, all we did was assigned carrier numbers, um, uh, assigned the carriers unique ident identifiers um, with no further metadata created so far. We we just prioritized um, putting uh, we just prioritized getting the files. Um, and we want to simultaneously create uh, binding aids and upload upload content to uh, to our dams, which is Islandora eight. Um, Archive space and Islandora eight uh, quite nicely both provide CSV data ingest options uh, for Archive space. That's the bulk import archival object CSV, um, and uh, for Islandora eight, that's the um, that's Workbench. Um, this data is siloed, um, and much of this metadata um, is the same or similar, but there is some unique metadata needed for each um, for each of these processes. Um, so, what we want to want to avoid, which has been a, which has been a hang up here for a while, um, is uh, in these in these silos having duplication of effort between metadata sheets. 
um, between between the two spaces that we're working with. Uh, redundant, any redundant copy pasting, um, any errors, especially when we need to pass data to colleagues um, to get um, uh, to get the data uh, to get the data processed, or if we need to to clean ingested data um, after the fact. Um, and also getting overwhelmed by the size of these sheets. Um, both of these, um, uh, both of these, um, both of these CSVs uh, can be quite massive, um, and and some elements fairly confusing. Um, so we want to sort of reduce the complexity here. Um, there's a broader context here, which is that um, this is just for one need in one in one department at, at our archive at the American Philosophical Society, um, which is uh, in Philadelphia. Um, we wanted to make a, a a process that's extensible to others at the institution. Um, so um, we recently migrated from Islander or seven to Islander or eight, which was a, a which was major. Also, in the that, that involved a large amount of data cleanup. Um, in that process, which has taken a long time, we have a backlog of hundreds of thousands of pages of manuscript scans, as well as other as well as other forms of media uh, waiting to be uploaded. Many of these include existing metadata uh, within archive space um, that needs to be converted to Workbench um, CSV files. So it's a similar pro it's a similar it's a similar sort of challenge. Uh, we don't want to be copy pasting as we do this. Um, one answer that um, we come up with uh, here, at least in our department, is is to use Python for this. Um, it has very good CSV manipulation libraries. Um, it has other it has libraries to aid other processes, which I'll get into. Um, we have some staff experience here. Um, I'm the one making these Python scripts. I, I, I want to say at the beginning that I'm not. I'm not a coder. Um, I learned. Uh, I learned Python uh, for my music hobby, um, like a few years ago, and I've just. I've just been sort of ha hacking away at it um, until I sort of understand. Until I understand enough of the work that I have to do here, um, and it's relatively easy to read for um, for for um, for a um, for a language. Um, so the goal is to have a single a single minimal spreadsheet um, that can just just be filled in once by the user, um, and then all manipulation of data, um, all the all the all, all the mani all the manipulation manipulation of data into the spreadsheets that we the various spreadsheets that we need um, can be handled by Python scripts um, and a, a simple step by step workflow that um, the other staff can pick up. Um, so the first thing I was did with this is um, is to is to sketch out sort of the general flow of data uh, from where data exists, um, where data might exist, um, um, and uh, and to a spreadsheet and to the various files that we need. Um, had to identify fields that we'll use in Island or Workbench and Archive Spaces bulk import archival objects um, CSV. Um, and compare the fields uh, because they're often very similar, but not always the same. Um, they often have slightly different data, but in ways that are um, in ways that are uh, you can you, you can get Python scripts to just work on them uh, rather than rather than having to having to hand edit them. Um, so here's a uh, very early sketch of the flow of data and some type of scripts that I made. Um, this was a spreadsheet where I was comparing comparing the fields between the two. Um, between the two, um, uh, but between the two CSVs or the three CSVs rather um, that I needed to create in this, um, but over here we have the uh, we have what becomes the um, the column names for the spreadsheet that we create. Um, then here we have the various um, the various column names in the um, in the CSVs that we um, that we that we create from that. Um, and then information about what the data itself is, and then any transformations that have to happen. This is all sort of very sketch notes. Um, uh, the the full the full extent of this comes out in the code itself. Um, and so uh, this is the workflow that that um, um, that uh, I came up with for this, which is um, first you're preparing the CSV files. So we've got all this. We've got all these audio files. Um, that we've that we've received from, from the vendor, we give them um, we give them uh, component unique identifiers as their names. That's all we have. Um, so we pre-populate a spreadsheet that uses this uses these uh, uses these identifiers. Um, we then fill out um, the spreadsheet with all the data um, that with all the metadata that we can add. So listening through to the files, um, 
uh, looking on the on the carriers themselves for any handwriting that sort of thing that we can fill out uh, we fill it out into the into into the relevant fields um, uh, most of which will be will be things that will be familiar to archive space users um, and run a validation script on this uh, just to make sure that we filled everything out everything out right um, and then to generate from this uh, what ends up being three CSV files. I haven't talked about um, MP3 tag yet, but basically this is um, uh, if we if we're creating audio files, uh, we also want to we also want to add tags. They're called ID3 tags, um, and these are if it basically if a if an audio file ever gets lost or somebody downloads it and they get it later and they don't know what it is, this will tell you some basic information about what the recording is um, for them. Um, so this is another another part of the process. Um, and then the next steps of the workflow are applying these CSV files. So you get these, you get these CSVs, um, you tag the WAV files that you have, the audio files with these, um, with the CSV that's created from the metadata that you, that you created. Um, unfortunately, this can't be done in a Python library as far as I can, I can work out. Um, it works for MP3 files. Um, there's there's libraries for that, but there's not libraries for WAV files that I can find. If anyone knows of one, that would be great because this is an annoying, annoying uh, extra step with an extra program that we have to use. Um, then we run the Islandora workbench um, uh, process, which is uploading to um, the uh, which is uploading um, the digital files to the um, to, uh, to Islandora eight. Uh, from this, we receive um, a list of nodes. Um, uh, that were created as part of this uh, as part of this process, um, which can be used to create links from Archive Space. Um, so then we update the Archive Spaces um, CSV, uh, the bulk import um, archival objects CSV, uh, with these newly created nodes uh, automatically, um, um, uh, and um, those um, Oh, and in ways that then become uh, become fully fledged out um, digital objects in the several fields that require this. Um, and then we ingest the archive space CSV. Um, and then we're done. We have a full audio collection in archive space and Islandora with any custom note, any sort of notes that we wanted to add, any restrictions, all that kind of thing we we um, we we established in um in just in the spreadsheet that we created. Um some good principles found for uh, for doing this with Python. Um, I mean, these are good general principles for Python, but like as I say, I, I'm this is relatively new to me. I'm still learning, um, and um, and these the, this project is the is the first. It's sort of the most complicated project I've I've taken on in Python. Um, so um, these have been very useful. Um, splitting codes into lots of uh, individual functions, also lots of individual individual files. Um, where the functions just do one thing to one piece of data, or one thing to two pieces of two pieces of data that you have to say combine, or something like that. Um, function names should explain exactly what they do. So the function seconds to hhmmyy will take a an input of seconds and will output it as a hh colon mm colon yy, uh, which is like a nice extent um, for dealing with audio files. Um, Distinguish between code that the user will run directly um, and code that's run internally by other code. Um, Python tends to use the underscore prefix to, to indicate internal scripts. I might not be doing that quite right, but it it looks neater for sure. Um, uh, use well-documented and maintained libraries. Um, so that sometimes involves some searches because people can create new libraries all over the place with GitHub. Um, sometimes they're good ones, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, and document everywhere uh, in comments, in readme files, and in like full documentation for the um, for any for any users and for any other staff who might want to work on this. Um, so uh, finally, I'm just going to run through a few libraries and functions. Um, so from reading and writing to CSV and uh, Excel, XLSX, which is uh, Excel files, um, there's a, there's an internal to Python CSV module, uh, which is quite basic. There's an XLSX writer, which is very, very good for Excel. And there's pandas, which can do both. But um, I'm finding that XLSX is actually a little more limited in this. So I think I'm using a, I'm going to be end up using a combination of all of these. Um, here I've got some I've got some functions um, that are using uh, that are 
basically validating uh, against custom control vocabularies that we have. Um, these control vocabularies I store in a CSV file. Here you have one uh, on the right-hand side, you can see one for the ISO 639 uh, language codes um, and their names. So the names are first and then the language code. Um, th this way, the files are very easily updatable if we, if we, need, to, if we need to change, uh, if we need to change the value. Um, you, can just, you can just open the CSV file in any text editor, add a value, take away a value, um, and then save it, and then it, and then it's back. It's, it's there again, and we have this. We have this available internally. Um, so here's here's a few uh, a few scripts that basically take in an input. Say, is this value in this CSV file? And if not, then um, then it returns an error. Um, so this is for when a user is like thinks their data is fine, and then you check. Um, Getting uh, the audio duration from a wave file is very easy. Um, this is the this is the function for that. It takes uh, it takes a file. Um, it uses a mutagen library. Um, it gets the length of that file and it returns it. Um, and then you turn it into the uh, into an extent, uh, which you can use um, sort of a custom extent field in in our, in archive space uh, for this um, to represent it in, as hours, minutes, and seconds. Um, Validating an uh, extended date time format um, is quite easy in itself. Um, this is uh, this is an extended version of the sort of of the regular ISO um, format, um, and um, but uh, we did I did need to do some further validation um, uh, to make it work and to make a reduced to um, to see where where my dates are good for um, are good for archive space as well. Um, linking and splitting strings, uh, splitting text. Um, you use you join strings together. You can use regular expressions, which is the whole, the whole thing. But um, uh, they can they can be quite simple. Here I've got one that just takes off everything before the hyphen in a um, um, in a in a string um, because I want to use that in some way. Um, and then here I just have a screen showing like this is most of my working my working folder. Um, you see these four files called. CNAIR audio. Um, these are the four files that the that the user would run, um, and these are and they they import other libraries um, that I've created other files from the same uh, from uh, from the same directory. Um, for future improvements, um, this isn't finished yet. This is very close to being finished, but we don't have the work. We don't have the, the everything in place to be able to test it yet. Um, I want to be able to use this data, as I said, from existing archive space data. Uh, currently, the way, the way to do that is, is using the bulk update spreadsheet. As far as I understand, that's actually going to be sort of integrated into the archive space um, core code soon. Um, so I'll have to adapt, adapt that. Um, but there will be a way, I want a way to, to uh, transform that into, um, into, into a workbench CSV. Uh, add validation for every field. There's a lot of workbench fields and archive space fields. That's just going to take a long time, but I think that's worthwhile. Um, and having spreadsheets with drop-down fields um, that people can select from. Um, again, that's just a little bit more complicated. I just have to learn this um, these uh, Excel libraries a bit more. Uh, feel free to. Uh, I, so I had a, I'm not putting my code up at the moment. Um, I may put my code up on, on GitHub at some point. I have to talk to other staff, but um, feel free to email me if you have questions about this or want to see the or want to see the code later once it's finished. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, great timing. We have four minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or I can read uh, anything that comes through in the chat. But thank you so much for that. Michelle says it's amazing and would love to see the code when it's finished. <laughs> then she'll reach out. Cool, please do. Thank you. Um, question from Corey: Do you expect to write or are writing um, unit tests for your Python functions? Uh, so, my limited Python knowledge, I understand unit tests to be where you're test, where you're um, you're testing. Uh, you sort of have a core, like a, a central piece of code that you can you can you can run to make sure that everything is working. Is that right? I don't think Corey is able to unmute himself. Um, okay. Yeah, pretty much a standard set of tests to run against test data. Um, 
I, I, I have something in the work. I have something in the works um, along that line. I, I'm. It's not going to be. It's not going to be as neat as a unit test. Um, but I do have a testing file that I'm running against every function that I'm that I'm doing. Um, I will need to have something more robust uh, for when we sort of make updates. And um, the, the also uh, one thing I didn't know is that that um, uh, to avoid like conflicts with um, with where the output CSV files are stored and where the input files are stored. Um, I'm having just at the moment just having everyone copy everyone who's going to use it copy this to their local drive um, so that they can so that they can um, so that they can run it by themselves. Um, that's not perfect, um, but that's that's going to work for the small number of people who are going to be working with this code at, at this stage. Um, so versioning, unit tests, things like that um, may be down the line, but I'm I'm not sure that something so um, that something that's like so specific to just a few of us is is really going to need this at this at this point. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, great. Yeah, um, we are at about time. I'm, there's no other questions in the chat. I'm speaking slowly in case one pops up. But otherwise, yeah, thank you so much, Paul. That was great. Um, and we're going to go ahead and move on to our next and last session. Um, if you would like to go ahead and stop sharing your screen and um, Valerie is here. Okay, and Valerie, you're up next. If you would like to go ahead and share your screen while I read your introduction and we can go ahead and get started. All right, so uh, last up but not least, uh, we have troubleshooting PDF export errors with Valerie Adonisio of Atlas Systems. This presentation will include demonstration and troubleshooting of some common PDF export errors, guidance for understanding error log messages, and tips for identifying and resolving the encoding issues that are usually to blame. Valerie, over to you. Thank you so much, Jessica. So as you can hopefully see on my screen, hello. Um, this presentation is based on my experience hosting customers, hosting, uh, supporting customers, uh, hosting archive space at Atlas Systems, a registered service provider. I don't see these errors as often as I used to, but I do hope this information is helpful to some of you. I will be essentially presenting my brain as a flowchart when I see spreadsheet export errors. And these are the errors that you get when you are attempting to export I said spreadsheet, when you are attempting to export a PDF version of a finding aid on the staff side in particular. So this flowchart, before you panic and try to take a screenshot of it, don't worry, you are going to get, if you go to the wiki and you see this is my session right here, there is a handout. You can download not only what you see on the screen, but the PDF version has not only what you see on the screen, but it has some handy facts, especially this working with XML section, which is going to become relevant to you later when I start suddenly working in a development environment and you say, but I don't have that. Don't worry, download my handout, you'll get this. And you'll also get some easy instructions on how to get some free tools, the exact same tools that I'm using with you today. So let's start on the top of our flowchart. We're not going to read every single one of these boxes um, because that's just not possible for 20 minutes. So what I'll do instead is I'm going to work you through the primary logic. And anything that's a white box with uh, dotted lines is essentially a sidebar or a clarification or something that's not really necessary for the solving of your problem, but it is there for additional information or as prompts uh, so that you don't have to rewatch this presentation. So at the very top, you see me state our problem. Whoops, I went in really tight, but I'm going to go here. I'm going to back up a little bit. That's too tight. So you have a PDF export error in archive space. I'm reading up here. And this is the key point. This is the only thing that you really need to take away from today if you ever get PDF export errors in archive space. Next line, all PDF exports begin as EAD exports with a style sheet transformation that creates a PDF. This is the most important takeaway. Next sentence, troubleshooting PDFs means troubleshooting XML in general and possibly EAD in particular. For those of you who may be EAD veterans, that might have been a light bulb moment for you. And for those of you who aren't, just know that even though you're getting an error because you've requested a PDF, the PDF itself isn't the problem. 
the EAD file that was generated as the first step to creating that PA, that PDF was the problem. And that is where all of your troubleshooting and all of your special skills and all of my, like the logic I'm giving you here should be applied. So over here, I walk you through the idea that the error, so starting here, is probably one or two, one of two scenarios. I've only seen two scenarios. So maybe my flowchart is incomplete. But scenario A and scenario B is where we're going to start. We're going to spend most of our time, we're going to spend 50-50, but most of the errors are actually scenario B. So scenarios A and B correspond to two different kinds of error messages. Here, if the error message says validation exception, you are in scenario A. If the error message says parse exception, you are in scenario B. And I can show those to you. So here I have generated an, a, a PDF. I got an, uh, an error message. And it is my parse exception error message right there. Here I've generated another PDF export error. And here is my validation exception error message. So I just want you to know that that's what you're looking for, these two words. You can ignore all the rest of this, by the way. You only ever really need to read the second line down. So with that in mind, I want to say that both of these, these exception error messages are XML errors, because I just told you that you're looking really at, a, at an EAD file that's gone wrong. And both of them are syntax errors. But there is an important distinction between how complicated a syntax error can be. And for that, I'm going to use trusty old Word. Do you remember when Word only had spell check? And you got the little red lines for the first time, and you were like, oh, that's awesome. And then grammar check came along. So grammar check has had an effect on my grammar. And that's true. I actually have learned things from it. There is a difference in the complexity between a spell check error, which is sort of a true false, a black and white, a very yes or no. You either spelled this word correctly or you didn't. And if, if you have the right dictionary, American English in this case, then word can say this is spelled wrong or right. You might already know where I'm going with this, though, about the difference for a grammar error. Effect is spelled correctly. I have simply used it incorrectly. There's a lot more going on for word to understand that I have used this word incorrectly. It's not as black and white as this is spelled wrong or this is spelled right. This second one has to have an entire knowledge of the English language. It has to have understanding. And we're in the world now of you know AI and this kind of stuff is going to become so much part of our lives that it's going to freak us all out. But this really shows us something that there's a difference between the complexity of a spell check error versus this error. And I'm going to call back to those leveling differences of complexity, starting with a parse exception error. A parse exception error is much more like the spell check. It either is or is not spelled correctly, black and white, yes or no, true or false. So coming over to our, our box right here, if you see a parsed exception error, then this probably means that you have an encoded element, and you see I have a bracket here and a bracket here as a callback to this is XML. This probably means an encoded element is not well formed somewhere in your finding aid. It is the simpler of the two errors explored here. So I'm going to show you, I happen to know exactly where this error, oh, oh and actually to, um, to go back to the error message, here it says parse exception. Here, it tells us the element type emf must be terminated by the matching end tag emf. So what has happened here is that somewhere in my finding aid, I have two tags that don't match. Very true, false, black and white, yes, no. This should match this. So the question for this particular error message isn't what's wrong, because I actually know what's wrong now. It's where is this wrong? And this is something that I want to point out. Savvy EAD users, or really anybody who's used to working with code, will see a line and a column number here. That feels like it's telling you where the error is. This isn't actually helpful to you, I'm sorry to say. This is where the parser in encountered the error in the parser's code. It is not where the parser found the error in the EAD. If you go to EAD line number 20, column 57, you will not find your missing emf tag. So that is a, a red herring. Don't follow it. Don't follow this instruction of location instruction when you will get a parsed exception error. 
So let's go look at this error and let's talk about how to solve it. Here's my parsing error collection. I put this collection together. I know exactly where the parsing error is, so I'm gonna bring you straight to it and cheat. It's in my scope and content note right here. And here's a good example of a common encoding error where someone in the past was hand encoding an emphasis tag in EAD, very common in the past, and they mistyped the closing tag. Now, of course, there could be all different variations on this, but the very basic point here is one thing doesn't match another thing. If you make these two things match, and you'll see the colors change, ta-da, I have solved the issue. But that's not real life because this is only a finding aid that is, it has nothing. There's no children. Uh, I only have one note. So real life is more like this, where you have hundreds of components or archival objects in a giant, well-processed, fully described collection. You could have um, well-formed issues all over the place, parsing issues all over the place. How do you find it? So remember, or this is a prompt, that in my flowchart, you might notice eventually when you start to use it that all arrows point here. Export the record as EAD. You might not be after EAD. You might never have even used EAD. You want a PDF. But the best way to find the error that's creating your PDF error, unless you immediately know where it is, is to export the record as EAD. Because even when a record won't export as PDF, it probably will export as EAD. So open the record as EAD. I'm sorry, export the record as EAD. And then here it says, open EAD file in an editor that recognizes XML. And this is where you say, I don't have an editor that recognizes XML. And here's where I remind you that I gave you a handout. So what you're about to see me do, you should be able to do after you read my handout. This is the real life collection, which I've called it, exported at, at, as EAD directly from archive space. The first thing I'm going to do in my code editor is I'm going to do is a right click and format. All code editors have this option. If it's not right click for you, it's something else. And this creates a human readable, but you can see how large my collection is. This creates a human readable version of my XML file. And immediately upon opening an XML file in an editor that recognizes XML, it will immediately complain. And so I want you to look on the right-hand side as I scroll. It's all a bunch of text that looks the same, but see that red line that's coming right there. That red line tells me, here's my error. And when I hover over it, it gives me the exact same message. The element purse name, in this case, must be terminated by the matching end tag purse name. So by using the editor, I can find where in the huge hierarchy my error, or plural, errors occurs. Because as you solve the first one, your editor will continue to validate, and it will continue to find all of the different places where you have mismatched tags. And that don't, um, and I don't recommend making your changes in EAD and then importing back in. I recommend going back into archive space, finding these errors, and then changing them in archive space. So that's great for our scenario B. But you'll notice how many more boxes there are on the screen. That's because scenario A is more complicated. Scenario A says validation exception. Down here, we begin to read. This means something about your record doesn't meet the expectations of the style sheet trying to transform EAD into PDF. This is a more complex error. And the reason for that is because this starts to shade into whether or not not something is valid XML, which is actually quite low barrier to meet. It starts to care about whether this is valid EAD, the type of XML specific to the archival profession, and which has its own grammar, which has its own grammar, a way of using elements in order or with other elements or whatever to create a syntax appropriate or a syntax correct sentence in this case, or actual EAD in another case. So this becomes a whole different level of complexity where if you've already used EAD before and you used validator, you know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, this is a new journey for you. So a few things about validation errors. The first is let's go back and I'm actually gonna close the parse error so that I don't get lost in it. 
in the parse error, I told you that the only thing that you really needed was to read the error and to ignore the location. This time, though, I am telling you that the location can help you. So here we go, validation exception. The next thing this error message says, I hope you can see this, I'll make this a little bigger. It says file, archive space, style sheets, ASEAD PDF.XSL 81957. What does this mean? The first time I told you, so this, this means that on line 819 of this style sheet is where archive space hit the error that gave you your validation error. It does continue to tell you more. FO list block is missing child elements. I kind of recognize the word list. I know what child elements are. Required content model marker list item, C position 819. This is not a user friendly <laughs> error message. I didn't know what Archive Space was talking about the first time that I read this. So what I did was I went to go find the ASEAD PDF.XSL and I wanted to go find 819. While I told you that that wasn't going to help you the first time, this time it really will help you. So how do you find this? Google Archive Space GitHub. Go to the Archive Space GitHub and follow the path that you were given, Archive Space, Style Sheets, and I have it memorized, of course. So here I am on the Archive Space GitHub, Archive Space, Style Sheets, ASEADPDF.xsl. And then once you get here, even though you're not maybe comfortable or familiar reading with what's on the screen, hold on, bear with me. But before you do anything, come up here to this drop down menu under files, come to tags, and select what version of archive space you're on. Because this PDF, this style sheet, the way that EAD exports, everything is version independent. So I am going to explicitly select 350 because that's where we're on. You might be on 33, you might be on 34. So select 350 for me. Let the page reload. And now I'm going to go on a journey through this file that I will admit that I cannot understand. I have a general knowledge of XSL style sheets from, from back in my work experience, but I can't really read this either, frankly. But I'm still going to go down to line 819. Oh my goodness. 819. 819, right there. I see some familiar terms. We were told about a list block. That sounds right. I still can't really understand what is, but what does this mean? And I'm not really expect, I'm not expecting you to know what this means. I'm just telling you to go here for hints, for clues, for keywords, for things that might help you understand what you're looking at. Up here is the key is the thing that I needed when I solved this problem. This section header says this section, pretty much all this, of which 819 is part, formats, index, and child elements for index entry elements, corp names, subjects. This gave me the insight I needed to search for an index note, which I know is a list which has child elements. So clue A, clue B, clue C, clue D all came together in my brain to be like, oh, maybe this is an index element problem. So in one case, I, you could go and just search archive space, the resource for your index element, which might be at the top. So here's our validation error collection. And I, of course, here's my, here's my sneaky validation error. But in this case, I suggest also that you head straight for EAD. You don't necessarily have to go look at the style sheet. You're just looking for clues on the style sheet. In the end, export the record as EAD, open the EAD file in an editor that recognizes XML, and now we're going to get slightly more complicated in making that make, make sure that that editor knows that it's not looking just at XML. It is looking particularly at, Engl at, uh, at EAD. Just like Word has to know, this is American English, and you need to apply the rules of American English to this, to this grammar syntax issue. So how do we do that? I'm actually going to demonstrate that by using what is, I think, a tiny itsy bitsy bug. <laughs> So over here, this EAD file is my very short validation record scenario. 
I have an index. It's down there at the bottom of the screen. But remember, in the real life collection, I got a squiggly red line, just like in Word. Here's my squiggly red line with my error message, which isn't happening to be coming up. There it is. There's my error message. When I look at this exact same scenario, there's no squiggly lines. And this is a sneaky validation error because this paragraph text is fine. This is fine. It's got an open and closing tag. It's fine. The problem is that this index node doesn't have any children. And you wouldn't know that by just looking at the XML that this needs children. You wouldn't even know it by looking at this index in archive space. It doesn't say that there's any other required elements. There's no reason for you to think that this element as it is on the screen right now is not perfectly fine unless you have memorized the EAD tag library, which even I have yet to do. So now you have to know the difference between an XML document being well-formed spell checked versus valid, which is grammar checked. This is a simplistic you know, comparison, but bear with me. Now, I'm actually gonna show you how to do this. If you export EAD directly from archive space, you get this handy dandy header, which none of you need to know exactly what any of that means. But that header declares some things to my code editor here. It declares that this is an XML document. So my XML document editor was able to go and find my red squiggly line in my prior example. But it also tells my code editor, not only is this XML, this is EAD, a particular flavor of XML specific to the archival profession, validated according to those grammar rules. The first 15 times that I opened this finding aid in this to try to come up with this presentation, the validator didn't kick in. It took me a week to determine that starting in archive space 350, there is an extra S on HTTPS right up there on line three. Watch the index element with your eyes. Try to ignore my screen, my, my cursor is, I know that my cursor is going up here but ignore my cursor and just look at the index element down here on line 38. I'm going up, removing that S, and now I have a red squiggly line. This is no longer just an XML error. This is particularly an EAD error, and it sounds familiar. Child elements are missing from element index, and then it tells me what are the things that are supposed to be here instead. Now, going beyond this is, you know, knowledge of EAD that you may or may not have. How to correct this is knowledge of EAD that you may or may not have. But this is the main takeaway I want you to have is if you get a PDF export error, you almost undoubtedly have an XML error. You could have an XML error that's as simple as saying a word is misspelled or something isn't complete or doesn't match, or you could have an EAD error where the exact type of EAD that we use needs to be validated to be sure that it is complete. This is a validation error. And if you export your EAD into an environment like this, which remember, I've given you a PDF on how to set up. If you've exported it from archive space 350, then you need to remove the space. <laughs> I'm sorry that I have to give you an additional clarifier like that. But you just saw, if you, if you pay, pay attention down here at index, when I put the S back, that disappeared. When I took the S away, it appeared. And that is all I have the time for. Thank you, Valerie. Um, you do have a few extra minutes if there's anything else you'd like to clarify. Well, I'll see if anybody, uh, let's see, any questions that I can help clarify? Um, so far, um, my favorite question, slightly unrelated, what is the flowchart creation tool? You, there were uh, six pluses on that, so that's a plus six question, um, but Bree's guess is, is it whimsical? It is whimsical, and I could now officially not live without it. Um, Corey says, I also used Harvard's EAD checker, though it hasn't been updated in a minute. Um, can it check for validation errors? He says, I think it can check for validation errors. I'm not sure if anybody has any experience with that, but if I were to speculate off the top of my head, the reason that there would be one specific to, Arc to Harvard 
might be because they used to have a EAD site that relied on their EAD looking a particular way. So I don't know if that is the same as saying that it's valid EAD as it is as saying it is valid according to the needs of Harvard. But I, I bet you though that there is a huge overlap between those two things. Um, that that whatever comes out of the Harvard, I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it would be very likely that whatever comes out of the Harvard validator is still valid EAD. Yeah, that's a good distinction. I've also used that tool, Corey. But yeah, it's a very good point. I, I really don't yep. know. I haven't I haven't used it in a long time. Bree says, thank you for this presentation, Valerie. Your examples were very easy to understand. Yeah, always, always happy to have Valerie at the forum because we always learn something. And this is, this flowchart is great and uh, already available on our wiki. Eleanor says, thank you for pointing out the parse exception error red herring. I've definitely fallen for that. Yep, I fall, I've fallen for it too. Sarit. Sarit wants a Valerie fan group. I will charge admission. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Not seeing any other questions. Um, but uh, yes, Sarit, people agree with you. Um, <laughs> I'm also a Valerie fan, uh, but uh, no other questions in the chat. So um, go ahead and say thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much. Um, this was really helpful. This um, I I can already tell you that I am going to save and refer people and myself to uh, to the flow chart. That was great. Um, uh, and that is the last presentation of the forum. Uh, Sarit just posted one final time into the chat, a link to the wiki. Um, we will be making the recordings of today and yesterday's sessions available there as well as on our YouTube channel. And you'll find great resources like Valerie's um, uh, on the wiki as well as presentation slides from all of our presenters. Um, and that concludes the forum. So a big thank you to all of you for being here and, and sticking it out until the end. And thank you to all of our presenters today and to Valerie for being the last one. And again, to our forum planning team, this was, has been a really lovely process and I'm, I'm really pleased with the forum. So thank you all so much. And I'll see you at the next Archive Space event. Bye everyone. <laughs>